the human being. On the quest to understand ourselves scientifically, we know so much from the form to the organs, cells, molecules, atoms, waves, and more. Yet every new discovery teaches us one immutable and persistent lesson. We know very little of ourselves, our reality, our potential. Especially the mysterious psychedelic compound DMT. DMT or dimethyltryptamine is a molecule produced within the human brain that is also known to be the most potent psychedelic substance in the world. Groundbreaking research has recently taken place. 1931, a Canadian chemist named Richard Mansky synthesized an unsuspecting chemical that had been used for visionary and spiritual purposes for thousands of years. In June of 1965, German researchers Franzen and Gross discovered and quantified DMT in human blood and urine. In 1972, Saavedra and Axelrod demonstrated biosynthesis of DMT in mammalian tissues. Throughout the 1960s, scientists attempted to find a link between endogenous DMT and psychotic disorders. However, the results of these studies proved inconclusive. And then, due to the Controlled Substances Act of 1970, all research in all countries on all psychedelic compounds stopped. Decades went by, and these compounds, including the ones produced within, went unstudied. Only thanks to brave psychonauts like Dennis and Terence McKenna was the story of DMT kept alive. This is the story of DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, a simple compound found throughout nature which has profound effects on human consciousness. Even though it's the, the most powerful psychedelic drug known to man, it's in every single ecosystem all over the world. It exists in plants and grasses, and it's everywhere. I mean, it's really the craziest drug to be illegal everywhere because everyone's got it in their system. It's like you, everyone's holding. That was like Terrence everyone's McKenna's holding. line. Yeah, and uh, it's uh, a pretty intense stuff, man. If you do it, you will talk to intelligent beings from other dimensions, for real. <laughs> I mean, it sounds crazy. You would think that if there's something like that, that it would be on the front page. It's amazing that people don't know about it. I mean, it's the most incredible experience. I mean, we are such a, 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 like uh, an experience-obsessed society. I mean, everybody wants to go whitewater rafting, and people want to talk about, you know, my uncle climbed Mount Everest. It's all about experiences. We all want to ride roller coasters and see the craziest movies. There is a little powder, and you smoke this little powder, and it will change the way you look at everything. You won't care about <laughs> UFOs. If a UFO landed right out there, I'd be like, wow, yeah, they're probably from another planet. Whatever. It's not DMT. DMT is a hundred thousand times crazier than that. It's like mushrooms times a million plus aliens. <laughs> plus, <laughs> that's what it's like. And literally, I mean, it sounds, it's, it's crazier than you could possibly imagine or describe. If you take DMT, you will communicate with something. And it's, it's, it's so beyond description that me talking about it is like trying to explain a kaleidoscope to a blind man. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Like, there's no way you could explain it. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's so beyond anything you can explain. But something communicates with you when you when you do this stuff. And my words do it no justice. DMT and 5-methoxy DMT, they're not just about the visual experience. There's a huge emotional experience to it. And, you know, they, they induce ecstasy. At the turn of the 1990s, Dr. Rick Strassman at the University of New Mexico broke through that strict prohibition with the first human DMT studies as he injected nearly 400 doses into roughly five dozen volunteers. The design of the study was fairly straightforward. Give people DMT and measure as many variables as possible. Um, in the, in the case of this study, which was going to be the first new psychedelic research in the U.S. really for over 20 years, uh, I, I had to sort of anticipate a lot of objections that would come my way uh, from the regulatory agencies that oversee this kind of research. In the year 2000, Dr. Strasman published his findings in the book DMT, The Spirit Molecule. This book brought the topic of DMT to a mainstream audience outside of strict scientific circles. Dr. Strasman named DMT the spirit molecule based on the consistent reports of realer than real spiritual experiences from high dose administration. I started off seeing shapes and then there were cats and then I felt like I 
fell out of space and ended up at the Last Supper in heaven or something. I don't consider myself spiritual and I'm going, why, why would my brain take me there? I was going through some emotional turmoil and I didn't feel safe or welcome or like I had friends and it just felt at the end like it was okay and I was loved. A decade later in 2010, the book became a documentary hosted by comedian and podcaster Joe Rogan, catapulting the discussion of DMT and ayahuasca onto an even bigger global stage, reaching tens of millions of viewers. The craziest thing about DMT, because DMT is literally like having a meeting with God. It's like having a meeting with divine, unbelievably wise, incredibly loving energy, like whatever it is, the source of everything. And it leaves you so humbled that after, that after it's over, you have a, it's like literally like you're still you, you still look like you, you still wear the same clothes you are, but you're not really you anymore. I mean, you literally have been changed. You know, you have experienced something that very few humans experience. And the thought to me that people can go through their entire lives and not know about this is an incredible waste of time. It's like your life could be so much more positive and so much more interesting and fascinating and you, you would be so much more humble and aware of what you, you really are and where you really stand if you just have this experience. Yeah, it's just like a halloo, it's like a tree root, it's got DMT in it. So for someone like me, the ayahuasca experience is essential and I need to be beaten down occasionally. I had a really eye-opening experience of ayahuasca, it was really intense. And when it came to the ceremony itself, Megan said the experience lasted three nights and was, quote, incredibly intense. Everybody's journey is different. The second night, I went to, to hell for eternity. Um, yeah. And to just knowing eternity is, um, like, t torture in itself because there was no beginning, middle, or end. So you have, like, a real ego death. And Megan says the ayahuasca was able to help her in ways that therapy and hypnotherapy couldn't before. It just goes straight into your soul, and it takes you to the psychological prison that you hold yourself in. So it's, it's your own version of hell, and I was definitely there. Megan Fox gets candid about drinking ayahuasca with Machine Gun Kelly in Costa Rica. It's hard to top that one, man. The Till Death actress appeared on Monday's Jimmy Kimmel Live with guest host Arsenio Hall and opened up about her quasi-spiritual journey in the Central American wilderness with her boyfriend after drinking the psychoactive tea used in ceremonial rituals as a spiritual medicine, which BTW induces auditory and visual hallucinations. Do you guys know what ayahuasca is? Oh, yes! So we went, to, we went to Costa Rica to do ayahuasca like in a proper setting, like with indigenous people, and I was thinking it was like, glamping or something like that, it's still going to be like a some kind of five-star experience and you get there and you really are in the middle of the jungle and you don't get to eat after like 1 p.m. You have to walk a very far distance to get your water. You can't shower because they're in a drought. Nothing glamorous about it. It's all a part of sort of making you vulnerable so that you surrender to the experience. We smoke it. Once I try it, boom! Everything is went so fast and when I fell out, the only thing I was conscious about was out. My brain was still functioning, my thoughts, I could still talk to myself, I could hear my mind. And I was saying, I fucked up. And I killed myself. Because you killed the yeah. air. Like, I'm dying. It was really mind blowing. Spiritual in nature though, right? Yeah, like I you're just. Yeah, I really, um, my whole life totally changed. It sounds like a, a movie strip, a script, but it's really um, the real deal. At that moment, you're talking about like you come to and you are altered. You are altered and it stayed. Am, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I wake up, I'm happy, I'm laughing, I'm smiling. I'm saying, what the f really? What happened? Yeah. Really? I had no idea. So sex, it cocaine, for, championship it belt, it those forever. weren't happiness. Nothing, no. It lasts forever, but it was only 15 minutes. But it felt like hours. Mm -hmm. It was frightening. Because of that ego thing, because you yeah. realize you're small all of yeah, a sudden. Yeah, once I realized that I'm nothing, yeah. I realized mean, all my fancy clothes, my big clothes. Can you explain to me why it makes you emotional just talking about it? Because I imagine the, the reason it makes you emotional is because for four decades you've been trying to find happy, man. Well, you know, when you think you know everything, then you realize you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. That's a big awakening. You can call it growth or you can call it divine intervention. You do realize you're talking about the toad like someone would talk about God, right? Well, I don't know. I'm not going to say it's God. I'm not going to put nothing in the um, 
the same breath as God. The crazy thing is you can get alcohol everywhere. You can go to Dwayne Reed and buy a, bu a jug of wine and sure. get effed up. You yeah. know? I mean, we have we have drugs that are available. I mean, how many times you talk to a girl, oh, I don't do drugs. I mean, you know, she's hammered, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody, there's there's drugs, caffeine. I mean, I'm drinking a coffee right now. It's just, it's sanctioned. It's a sanctioned drug because it's it's great for capitalism. It keeps you going. It keeps you working. Mm. But there's, uh, you know, there's there's drugs out there that are actually good for you. There's drugs out there that are actually good for your mind. I do drugs because I, I find the state that psychedelic drugs put you in very fascinating and very introspective and you can learn a lot about yourself. You can learn about a lot about life because it removes you and your ego from the equation. You get to look at things from like a, a newborn's perspective. That's why I do it. I don't do anything like, I don't do coke or meth or anything dangerous, anything that's addictive. I have never done coke. I've never done speed. I've never done heroin. I, I won't do anything that can hurt you. But psychedelic drugs, those are, they're, they're very different. With this, this big blanket that we put on everything, we call everything drugs. That's a, a broad term that encompasses everything from like NyQuil to DMT, you know? I mean, they're all drugs. I mean, they're all, they all affect your consciousness. It's like, how do they affect your consciousness though? I'm not interested in anything that messes me up. I don't think, I'm not interested in anything that gives me brain damage or anything that makes me, you know, addicted to it. I just, I'm only interested in things that, that can alter my state of consciousness for the, the better. It's very, very intense. There's the but it's not dangerous. It's a human neurotransmitter. It's actually one of the most transient drugs ever exhibited in the body because your body brings it down to baseline really quickly. Your body brings it down to baseline in like 10 to 15 minutes. It's really crazy. What's that mean, down to baseline? It yeah. means like, say, if you have it, you're high, you go to that dimension, it blows out, and then... 15 minutes later, you're back normal. And the crazy thing is, it's just like dreams. You know, you wake up and you're like, I had the craziest dream. It was me and my buddy Mike, and we were we were kids, but we had a sled, and my mom was there. And then five minutes later, you're like, what the hell was my dream? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly what a DMT trip was like. It's like gold dust slipping cool. through your fingers. If you go deep enough into the psyche, what you it becomes increasingly difficult to separate what you discover from reality now it's not people can clearly have individual subjective religious experiences most scientific phenomena are objective many people have to experience the phenomena at the same time you have these religious experiences that can be induced by hallucinogens let's say each person has their own particular experience but everyone has an experience that's similar and we don't know what to do about that category of experience. And then, you know, we think in stories and we see the world through a structure of value. I think that's, I think that that has been proven beyond a doubt by neuroscientists and psychologists. And the fact that we see the world through a prism of value seems to indicate that there's something about value that's real. And so, that's partly why things are deeply mysterious. I mean, Rick Strassman, he terrified himself right out of the DMT research, as far as I could tell, because all his subjects came back and said, well, you know, I went somewhere else and saw aliens. It's like, well, it was a dream. No, sorry, wasn't a dream, it was way more real than any dream. In fact, it was actually more real than life. Well, what do you do with that? DMT is ubiquitous in the natural world. Uh, it's found in hundreds if not thousands of plants uh, ones that are used for their psychoactivity and ones that aren't been you know, found in every mammal that's been studied I, I don't think you know DMT would have gotten anywhere near as you know, popular uh, during the first wave of clinical research if it weren't for the fact that it was endogenous As the public continued to show their interest in DMT with increasing internet searches, DMT began to hit the mainstream music scene. In and I'm at the trip to me, and I surge the gas without dynamite. The vibes are up for pheasant, delicious is how they should be. I done died and lived again on DMT, huh? See, this the type of how that won't come down. This the type of how Comedians began spreading the word about the experience. DMT is like, hey, you know all of this reality and perception that you are super familiar with and very convinced is real? Well, sorry about this. Zip. Everyone all of a sudden wanted to know, what in the world is DMT? 
and why do we produce this otherworldly compound in our brains? Give people DMT and they all came back with the same story. I was blasted out of my consciousness. What exactly does an LSD or DMT breakthrough feel like? Even the lesser understood compound 5-MeO-DMT began hitting popular internet shows, touting its mystical experience of oneness with creation. My experience with the 5-MeO is a connection to all that is. I felt the direct connection to spirit, to soul, to my own soul. Lesser known still is the fact that this compound too is found within humans. Just as the popularity of the DMT discussion seemed to be reaching its peak, it happened. Former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson decided to take the 5-MeO DMT plunge. Sounds like a, a movie strip, a script, but it's really um, the real deal. Following his 5-MeO DMT experience, Tyson would discuss his transformation from an ego-driven ex-fighter into a spiritually transformed individual. How does this happen to me? I'm not, I'm not leading my ship. I'm not driving this fucking car, not me. After Tyson made his 5-MeO-DMT use public in 2019, the interest in DMT reached an all-time high. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence that those two kinds of consciousness exist. One being your consciousness of you as a localized and specified being. And the other being this capacity to experience oceanic dissolution and the sense of the cosmos being one. Now why we have those capacities for different conscious experiences is very difficult to understand. I mean, part of me thinks that maybe we have a generic human brain that's the brain of the species and allied with that we have a specific individual brain and one is the left hemisphere and the other is the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere being the specific individual brain. And usually it's on and working because you obviously have to take care of yourself as a specific entity and not as a generalized cosmic phenomena. It's hard to dice salary when you're a generalized cosmic phenomena, <laughs> right? So you have to be more pointed than that. But, but look, let, let's make no mistake about it. The fact that those different states of consciousness exist is not disputable. They can be elicited in all sorts of ways. And so, I'm going to read you something that Aldous Huxley wrote about this back, I think, in 1956. This was after he started his experimentation with mescaline. Because the psychedelics were introduced into Western culture in the 1950s in a whole bunch of different ways. Psilocybin mushrooms, LSD, that was discovered right at the end of World War II. It was discovered by accident, actually, in a laboratory, Sandoz Labs, the guy who discovered it, Albert Hoffman, had spilled some on his hands. You can absorb it through your skin. And he was biking home and had the world's first LSD trip, which was <laughs> somewhat of a shock to him, and then to the entire world. But Huxley, who was a great literary figure, a, ge a real genius, um, experimented with mescaline in the late 50s. And... Uh, he wrote a book called The Doors of Perception, which had a huge impact on the emerging psychedelic culture, both on the East Coast at Harvard and on the West Coast with Ken Kesey and his merry pranksters, the people who popularized LSD. That's all documented in a book called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which I would highly recommend. It's Tom Wolfe. It's a brilliant book. Um, on the East Coast, it was Timothy Leary. I had Timothy Leary's old job at Harvard, so that was kind of cool, you know, warped way. So... I mess as well. Huxley was very interested in why you would even have the capacity for experiences like that, and which I think is a very good question, and it's a completely unanswered question. I mean, we don't know much about consciousness, and we know even less about psychedelics, I would say. They are an absolute mystery. I don't think we understand them in the least. 
Huxley did a good job of starting to at least map out the mysteries of the terrain. He said, like the earth of a hundred years ago, our mind still has its darkest Africas, its unmapped Borneos and Amazonian basins. <clears throat> In relation to the fauna of these regions, we are not yet zoologists. We are mere naturalists and collectors of specimens. The fact is unfortunate, but we have to accept it. We have to make the best of it. However lowly. What is you know, the hallmark of the DMT experience? People you know, come out of it and they say that was more real than real. You know, so there is a profound you know, sense of certainty and truth which is associated with elevated brain levels of DMT. If you wanted to speculate wildly, one could argue you know, that um, the DMT neurotransmitter system mediates our sense of reality. If it is correct that DMT mediates our sense of reality, then is reality itself a partial hallucination? Or could DMT be even more functional to our everyday waking consciousness than just psychedelic experiences? Well, maybe we're in a simulation right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Uh, <laughs> in my mind, like the, the, the strongest argument for the, for us being in a simulation, probably being in a simulation, I think is the following. Um, that that 40, called 40, 40 years ago, we had Pong, like two rectangles and a dot. That right. was what games were. Um, now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously, and it's getting better every year. And soon we'll have virtu you know, vir virtual reality, we'll have augmented reality. Um, if you assume any rate of improvement at all, um, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality. We should hope that that's true, because otherwise, if, if civilization stops advancing, then that may be due to some calamitous event that erases civilization. Another hypothesis is that breathing exercises can induce an increase in DMT in the brain, causing the visionary experiences that many have claimed are very similar to psychedelics. Could breath work affect the cerebrospinal fluid pulsations that affect the way that cerebrospinal fluid is generated? You know, it's a signal to the choroid plexus to produce more of a certain compound, possibly DMT. While visionary experiences induced by breathing exercises have been reported for thousands of years. Well, that's one of the big challenges of psychedelic research, I think, is to try to, to bridge this profoundly subjective experience and link that to, to an objective, measurable thing. Nick Glinos is one of the newest additions to Jimo Borjigan's lab in Michigan. Raised with an independent and slightly rebellious side, his time in Panama studying botany gave way to an interest in psychedelics and their beneficial altered states drew him to endogenous DMT. Psilocybin and LSD and MDMA and all of these other uh, psychoactive compounds that people are studying are extremely interesting and extremely powerful, but none of them are produced naturally by the body. So DMT gives us this opportunity to look at a naturally produced compound that may be affecting consciousness in a way that we don't know yet, and to use that to make a bridge or a link to the subject subjective experiences that are uh, being elicited by some of these breathwork practices. Even from personal experience, I, I know that certain types of, of breathing can have uh, a profound impact on physiological processes that are happening in the body. And whether or not that plays a role in uh, anything related to DMT or 5-MeO DMT, I can't really say at this time. It sounds, it's, it's crazier than you could possibly imagine or describe. If you take DMT, you will communicate with something. And it's, it's, it's so beyond description that me talking about it is like trying to explain a kaleidoscope to a blind man. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. Like, there's no way you could explain it. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's so beyond anything you can explain. But something communicates with you when you, when you do this stuff. And my words do it no justice. 
craziest thing about DMT because DMT is literally like having a meeting with God. It's like having a meeting with divine, unbelievably wise, incredibly loving energy, like whatever it is, the source of everything. And it leaves you so humbled that after, that after it's over, you have a, it's like literally like you're still you, you still look like you, you still wear the same clothes you are, but you're not really you anymore. I mean, you literally have been changed. You know, you have experienced something that very few humans experience. And the thought to me that people can go through their entire lives and not know about this is an incredible waste of time. It's like your life could be so much more positive and so much more interesting and fascinating. And you, you would be so much more humble and aware of what you, you really are and where you really stand if you just have this experience. Do you think it's interesting that it was in the visual cortex, for instance, because there are so many reports of people who undergo uh, near-death experiences who see uh, extreme bright lights or who even have very visual representations of a life review, for instance. Where is that visual interpretation coming from? Those results never got published, yet nobody's really funding the, 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 the work for it. We're basically trying to understand the mechanism of action of how psychedelics can bring about these increases in mental health, these treatments for, uh, for a variety of different ailments. If we're able to show, for example, that DMT is massively increased, uh, endogenous DMT is massively increased after a, a administration of LSD or psilocybin, then I think that has massive implications for the future of all psychedelic research moving forward. The importance of funding endogenous DMT studies is that it may provide a basis for all psychedelic research into which millions of dollars are funneled. But it could also give us a better understanding of what modulates everyday waking reality, of the neurochemistry of altered and mystical states. What if DMT was the missing link between all religions? What if the foundation of all spiritual experiences might have a basis in biology? Could this help bring humanity together? If drugs out there that are actually good for you, there's drugs out there that are actually good for your mind. I do drugs because I, I find the state that psychedelic drugs put you in very fascinating and very introspective and you can learn a lot about yourself, you can learn about a lot about life because it removes you and your ego from the equation. You get to look at things from like a, a newborn's perspective.